I would remind you that you are nothing but a despicable, child-murdering, cowardly, impotent eunuch and pervert masquerading as a human being. As far as I'm concerned, Dennis Rader does not deserve to live. I want him to suffer. It's been almost 19 years now that my brother and I had the most important woman in our lives taken from us. I would only ask that the court provide the maximum sentence allowed by law to this monster. It is always those left behind who suffer the most. Narcissism is a personality disorder that results in a person's inflated sense of self-admiration. It can be characterized by a person's self-absorption, callousness, authoritarianism, and an inflated image of self-worth. This doesn't mean that a person truly embodies excessive self-love, but rather uses the inflated perception as a coping mechanism to hide from insecurities. In this video, we will take a look at Dennis Rader, better known as the BTK Killer, one of the most elusive serial killers in American history. He was born on March 9, 1945 in Pittsburgh, Kansas, and grew up in Wichita, Kansas. The BTK killer had an ordinary childhood. He had loving parents and was one of four boys and was never abused as a child. This is contrary to many serial killers who tend to grow up in broken homes and suffer from abuse as children. The BTK killer did show an early sign of a serial killer, however. He would often kill stray animals by torturing and hanging them. The nature versus nurture debate is a point of study when it comes to serial killers. Nature refers to a person's inherited characteristics at birth while nurture refers to a person's acquired traits throughout life. Nurture is not limited strictly to a person's environment, but is broad enough to encompass a person's actions against him or herself. When the BTK killer was young, he assisted his grandmother in killing chickens that were raised in the family farm. It is said that one day while killing one of the chickens, he noticed that he became aroused by the killing of the chicken. It was at this point in his life that he began to equate death and violence with sexual pleasure. He would thereafter suffocate himself and later his victims to achieve sexual gratification. He held what he called motel parties. He would rent a motel room and would bind his ankles and wrists. He would then cover his head with a bag to partially suffocate himself. He also did this in other less discreet locations, such as his parents' house, his car, and even during Boy Scout trips. During his murder spree, the BTK killer would dress up as his victims and would take pictures of himself in different positions. This autoerotic fantasy was an attempt to satisfy his desires between his murders. The BTK killer was an anomaly in that sense. He didn't escalate quickly and spiral out of control like most serial killers. He could lurk in the background for prolonged periods between murders, which helped him go undetected for over 30 years. In the following video, the BTK killer explains his process for selecting his victims. He refers to his victims as projects, as if they are objects would compartmentalize his secret life and family life by disassociating the two personalities. I read much about serial killers. They go through what they call the different phases. Uh, that's one of the phases they go through as a, a, as a trolling stage. You're basically, you're looking for a victim at that time. And that, you could be trolling for months or years. But once you lock in on a certain person, you become stalking. And that might be several of them, but you really home in on that person. Many, what I call them projects, they were different people in the town that I followed, watched. Uh, Kathleen Bright was one of the next targets, I guess, as I would indicate. How did you select her? Uh, just driving by one day, and I saw her go in the house with somebody else, and I thought that's a possibility. It just was basically a selection process, work toward it. If it didn't work, I'd just move on to something else. Now you, you call these projects. Uh, Potential hits, uh, in my world, that's what I call them. So you call projects, hits. You were engaged in some kind of fantasy during this period of time? Uh, yes, sir. All right. Now, when you use the term fantasy, is this something you were doing for your personal pleasure? Uh, sexual fantasy, sir. On January 1974, the BTK killer committed what would be his first four murders out of a total of ten murders. His first victims were the Otero family, which included the mother, the father, a nine-year-old son, and an 11-year-old daughter. He will appear disinterested and bored when recounting the details of his murders, as if describing mundane and trivial tasks. He will also reveal his self-absorption, sounding bored by the horrific acts he imposed on the family, while simultaneously focusing on minor annoyances that affected him negatively, like the family's dog. Well, I confronted the family, uh, pulled a pistol, uh, confronted Mr. Otero, and asked him to, uh, you know, that I was there to basically, I was uh, wanted 
Uh, wanted to uh, get the car. I was hungry, food I was wanted, and uh, asked him to lie down in the uh, living room. The dog was a real problem, so I uh, asked Mr. O'Terrell if he could get the dog out, so he had one of the kids put it out. The BTK killer claims he knew the mother was home with two of her children, but didn't know the father was also home that day. This put a wrench in his plan, so he panicked. And then I took him back to the bedroom, uh, the family, the bedroom, the four members. All right, what happened then? At that time, I tied him up. While still holding him at gunpoint? Well, in between tying and yes. Yeah. All right, after you tied them up, what occurred? Well, uh, they started complaining about uh, being tied up, and I re re-loosened the bonds a couple of times. Uh, tried to make Mr. Otero as comfortable as I could. Uh, apparently, he had a cracked rib from a car accident, so I had him put a pillow down on for his head. Made a decision to go ahead and, and put him down. I guess or strangle him. Uh, put a plastic bag over his head and then some cords and then tighten it. First of all, Mr. Otero was strangled or a bag put over his head and strangled. Then I thought he was going down, and I went over and strangled Mrs. Otero. I thought she was down. Then I strangled uh, uh, Josephine, I thought she was down. And then I went over to Junior and put the bag on his head. Since he had never killed before, the BTK killer did not know the kind of pressure and duration that was needed to strangle someone to death. It is not uncommon for fantasized murders to be unsatisfying to the killer. In reality, the messy nature of a murder rarely lives up to the fantasy inside the killer's mind. This will often lead to the killer creating more elaborate fantasies. We will see that, as the number of BTK victims increases, so do his dark fantasies. After that, Mrs. Otero woke back up and, uh, you know, she was pretty upset what's going on. So I came back and... Uh, at that point in time, strangled her uh, for, for the death strangle at that time. With your hands or what? No, with a cord, with a, with a rope. And uh, then I uh, I think at that point in time, I redid Mr. Otero, put the bag over his head, uh, went over, and then to Junior. Oh, oh, before that, she asked me to, uh, to, to uh, save her son. So I actually had to take the bag off. And then I was really upset at that point in time. So basically... When Mr. Otero was down, Mrs. Otero was down, I went ahead and, and uh, took uh, uh, Junior up in another bag over his head and took him to the other bedroom at that what, time. What did you do then? Uh, put a bag over his head, I put a, a cloth over his head, a t-shirt, a bag so he didn't tear a hole in it. And uh, he such probably died from that. Wow. And then when I went back, uh, Josephine had woke back up. What did you do then? And I took her to the basement and eventually uh, hung her. Are you hunger in the basement? Yes, sir. Did you do anything else at that time? Yes, I, uh, I had some sexual fantasies. But that was uh, after she was hung. After the BTK killer concluded his fantasy with the daughter in the basement, he began to clean up the crime scene. He leaves the house through the front door. The entire murder, from start to finish, is a transformation for the BTK killer. We can see this in the way that he enters and exits the crime scene. He feels small and insignificant in the beginning. This is also shown through his timid entrance into the house through the back door. By the end of the incident, however, he has gained confidence and leaves through the front door with no regard of being seen by a bystander. We went through the house, uh, kind of cleaned it up. Uh, it's called the right hand rule. You go from room to room, uh, picked everything up. I think I took uh, Mr. Otero's watch. There, I guess I took a radio. I uh, I'd forgot about that, but apparently I took a radio. Why did you take these things? I don't know. Um, I have no idea. And uh, clean the house up a little bit, make sure everything's packed up and left through the front door. Taking items as trophies from the crime scene is a common practice for serial killers. Taking a trophy allows the BTK killer to relive the pleasure he felt during the crime at a later date. Did you take personal items in every one of these incidents? Uh, I did on the hedge. Uh, I don't remember anything at uh, Vicky's place. The Ocheros, we got the watch and the radio. I don't think I did any in Bright's. Uh, Vians, no, I don't think so. Fox, yes, I took some things from Fox. It was hit and miss. All right. But uh, in probably if it, if, it, if, it was, if it was a control situation where I had more time, <laughs> I took something. But if it, if it was a 
confusion and other things I didn't. After the murders were over, in a sad turn of events, the three other Otero children would come home from school to find their parents and siblings dead. On April of that same year, three months after his first killing, the BTK killer struck again. He broke into Catherine Bright's apartment and hid in her closet until she came home. Instead of arriving at her apartment alone, as the BTK killer expected, however, she came home with her brother, Kevin Bright. The BTK killer emerged from the closet with a gun, claiming that he was going to rob them. Uh, tied his feet to the uh, bedpost, upon the bedpost so he couldn't run. Uh, kind of tied her in the other bedroom, and then it came back to strangle him. And at that time, we had a fight. Were you armed with a handgun at that time also? Yes, I had a handgun. What happened when you I came back? I actually had two handguns. Uh, well, I started strangling. The, either the uh, parent broke or he broke his bonds and he jumped up real quick like. I pulled my gun and quickly shot him. I hit him in the head. He fell over. Uh, I could see the blood. And as far as I concerned, you know, I thought he was down and uh, was out. And then went and uh, started to strangle uh, after Catherine. And uh, then we started fighting because uh, bonds weren't very good. And so... Back and forth, we fought. Uh, you and Catherine? Yeah, we fought. Uh, and I got the best of her, and I thought she was going down, and then I could hear some movement in the other room. So I went back, and Kevin, uh, no, no, I thought she was going down, and I went back to the other bedroom where Kevin was at, and I tried to re-strangle him at that time, and he jumped up, and we fought, and, uh, and he about, at that time, about shot me because he got the other my pistol that was in my shoulder here. I had my magnum in my shoulder. All right, so you shot him a second time. Yes, sir. What happened then? Uh, went back to uh, uh, finish the job on Catherine, and uh, she was fighting. Uh, and at, at that point in time, I'd been fighting her, and I just, and then I heard some, I don't know whether I uh, was lo basically losing control. The uh, strangulation wasn't working on her, and I uh, used a knife on her. I stabbed her, I think she said either stabbed two or three times, uh, either here or here. Maybe two back here and one here, or maybe just two times back here. Well, it was a total mess because I didn't have control on it. Uh, she was bleeding. Uh, she went down. I think I just went back to check on Kevin, or at that basically same time I heard him escape. It could be one of the two. But all of a sudden the front door of the house was open and he was gone. The BTK killer had a kit that he called his hit kit. The kit included items he used to bind his victims. He didn't always use his own tools, however, and he would sometimes improvise, as was the case with Catherine and Kevin. If, if I had brought my stuff and used my stuff, uh, Kevin would probably be dead today. Oh. I'm not bragging on that. It's just a matter of fact. It's the bonds I uh, tied him up with, that he broke them. So. And, that, uh, All right. and maybe the same, uh, same way with Catherine. It, was, it got, out of, got out of hand. Despite being shot once in the side of the head and once in the face, Kevin Bright survived the horrific encounter with the BTK killer. Your Honor, my name is Kevin Bright, and it's fine. And this is victim impact statement, and I'm here representing my late sister Kathy. My sister, she suffered so much, and this wasn't told in the as it brought out here that she it was brought out that she fought as quote as a hellcat and i'm so proud of her for that because i knew you know she had that in her and uh but she lived on approximately five hours after that and she received over 20 pints of blood before she lost her battle and i just think you know how much she fought it was reported that I had brain damage and, you know, permanent da brain damage, and I don't have that, but I have permanent uh, nerve damage, which causes me to suffer with, uh, my body doesn't regulate the heat very well and, and humidity, and so I overheat and I, you know, get weak and everything. So that's one thing I suffer with for every day. And uh, then I also have damage, nerve damage that causes me not to be able to participate in, you know, eating food. It, my digestive system is, is out of whack. 
Three men confessed to killing the Otero family, and this brought out the BTK killer's narcissistic side. He wrote a letter and placed it inside an engineering book at the public library for the media to find. To be sure this letter was found, he called the Wichita Eagle newspaper and told them where to find it. In the letter, he took complete responsibility for the Otero family's killings, making it clear that the three men were lying. In the letter, he also created his new name, BTK, which stood for Bind, Torture, and Kill. The BTK killer communicated directly to the media in the hopes that the media would post about him. He gave himself a name in an attempt to control the narrative of his legacy. On 1977, three years later, the BTK killer struck again. This time he murdered Shirley Vian, a single mother of three children. The BTK killer explains that he was prowling, looking for a new victim, after a few failed attempts at breaking into other houses. He then approaches a young boy and his ruse begins. Ask him if he ID some pictures. Uh, kind of was a rust, I guess, a ruse, as you call it. Had to feel it out and saw where he went. And I went to another address and knocked on the door. Nobody opened the door. So I just noticed where he went and went to the house and knocked on the door and told him I was a private detective. Uh, showed him a picture that I had just showed the boy and asked him if they could ID the picture. And at that time I, I had the gun here and I just kind of forced myself in. I explained that uh, I had a problem with uh, sexual fantasies that I was going to tie her up. We went back, uh, she was extremely nervous. I think she even smoked a cigarette. And we went back to uh, one of the back, back areas of the porch, explained to her that I had done this before. So anyway, we went back to the, her bedroom and I proceeded to tie the kids up. And they started crying and got real upset. So I said, oh, this is not gonna work. So we moved them to the bathroom. She helped me. And then I tied the door shut. We put some toys and uh, blankets and odds and ends in there for the kids. Make them as comfortable as we could. Tied the, uh, we uh, tied one of the bathroom doors shut so they couldn't open it, and we shoved. She went back and helped me shove the bed up against the other bathroom door, and then I proceeded to uh, tie her up. Uh, she got sick, threw up, um, got her a glass of water, comforted her a little bit, and then I went ahead and tied her up, and then uh, put a bag, a bag over her head and strangled her. Uh, I actually, I think on that, I had tied uh, tied her legs to the uh, bedpost and worked up with the rope all the way up, and then what I had left over, I looped over her neck. Right, so you used this uh, rope to strangle her? Yes, I think I think it's the same one that I tied her body with. What happened then? Well, the, uh, the kids were really banging on the door, hollering, screaming, and, uh, and then the telephone rang, and they had talked about earlier that the neighbor was going to check on them, so I cleaned everything up real quick like and got out of there. Left and went back into my car. The BTK killer admitted that if it wasn't disrupted, then he would have killed Shirley's children as well. On December of that same year, Nancy Fox became the BTK killer's seventh victim. All right, did she come home? Yes, she did. What happened? Uh, I confronted her, uh, told her there I was a, uh, had a problem, sexual problems, that I would have to tie her up and have sex with her. Uh, she was uh, a little upset. Uh, we talked for a while. Uh, she smoked a cigarette. Uh, while, the, while we smoked a cigarette, I went through her purse, uh, identifying some stuff. And she finally said, uh, well, let's get this over with so I go call the police. I said, okay. And she said, can I go to the bathroom? And I said, yes. Uh, she went to the bathroom and, came, and I told her when she came out to make sure that she was undressed. And uh, when she came out, I uh, handcuffed her. And uh, I don't really you remember whether I, sir? You handcuffed her? You had a pair of handcuffs? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. What happened then? Well, anyway, I, had her, I handcuffed her, had her lay on the bed, and then I tied her feet. And uh, then I, I, I was also undressed to a certain degree. And then I got on top of her, and then I reached over. Took either, either her feet were tied or not tied. But anyway, I, took, I think I had a belt. I took the belt and then strangled her with a belt at that time. All right, after you had strangled her, what happened then? Okay. Uh, after I strangled her with the belt, I took the belt off and retied that with pantyhose real tight, uh, removed the handcuffs, and uh, tied those with, uh, with pantyhose. Can't remember the colors right now. Uh, I think I maybe retied her feet, but they had not already. They were probably already tied her feet were. Uh, and at that time, uh, uh, masturbated, sir. All right. The BTK killer self-reported this crime. He used a public phone and called 911. 
The police traced the call and a nearby witness was able to give a vague description. The description was that of a white male around 5 feet 8 inches in height with light colored hair. At this point, the authorities have been given three different descriptions of the BTK killer. One from Catherine's brother, Kevin, one from Shirley's three children, and now one from the witness that saw BTK using the public phone. This made it difficult for the authorities to find him. Even though the BTK killer has killed seven people at this point, the public is still unaware that there is a serial killer on the loose. Around this time, the BTK killer sent a poem to the Wichita Eagle newspaper. This poem outlined Nancy Fox's death. The BTK killer took an eight-year break before he struck again. Unlike most serial killers, he appears to have satisfied himself enough to be able to wait prolonged periods of time between murders, which he accomplished through his motel parties and other ways to relive the murders. During his break between murders, he wasn't fully dormant, however. He still stalked potential victims and outlined how he would kill each of them. The stalking was an important process for the BTK killer, as he obtained satisfaction from the mere control he felt by knowing something the potential victims didn't, and by violating their life even if they didn't know about it. Also because he was living a double life to cover his dark side, he had to wait for the time to be right before he could conduct another murder. He would need to have an excuse to be away from his family for an extended period of time, and the victim would have to be home and alone. On April 1985, the BTK killer would target someone close to home. He would target one of his neighbors, Maureen Hedge. All right, we have the taxi take you to Park City. What happened then? Uh, there I asked, I, I uh, pretended that I was a little uh, drunk. I just took, I just took some beer and forced it around my mouth. And that guy could probably smell the alcohol on me. I asked, told him to let me out so I could get some fresh air. And I walked from where the taxi let me out over to her house. And uh, lo and behold, her car was there. I thought, gee, she's not supposed to be home. So I very carefully snuck into the house, kind of like a cat burglar. And after checking the house, she wasn't there. So about that time, the doors rattled. So I went, went back to one of the bedrooms and hid back there in one of the bedrooms. Uh, she came in with a male visitor. They were there for maybe an hour or so. <coughs> he left. I waited till wee hours in the morning uh, and then proceeded to... Uh, sneak into her bedroom and uh, flip the lights on with the bike, or I think the bathroom lights. I just studied didn't want to flip her lights on, and, and she screamed, and uh, I jumped on the bed and strangled her manually. So you but, used your hands? Yes, sir. And you strangled her? Did she die? Yes. All right, what did you do then? Uh, after that, uh, since I was in the uh, sexual fantasy, I uh, went ahead and uh, stripped her, and uh, probably went ahead and uh, I'm not sure if I tied her up at that point in time. But anyway, uh, she was nude, and I put her on a blanket, uh, went through her purse, some personal items in the house, uh, figured out how I was going to get her out of there. Uh, eventually uh, moved her to the trunk of the car. Uh, took the car over to uh, Christ Lutheran Church. Uh, this is with the older church. And uh, I took some pictures of her. What happened then? Uh, that was it. I uh, went... Uh, Took, uh, she went through, I tied it, she was already dead, so I took uh, pictures of her in different forms of bondage. And that's probably what got me in trouble with the bondage thing. So anyway, that's the, probably the, the main. Yeah. Oh, uh, trying to find a place to hide her, hide the body. Did you find a place? Yes. Yes, I did. Web. Between, I think between Wed and Webb and Greenwich, I found a, a ditch, a low place <clears throat> on the north side of the road and hid her there. All right, you say you hit her there. Well, there were, some, there were some trees, some brush, and I laid that over the top of her body. The BTK killer was a Boy Scout leader. He planned a camping trip with his Boy Scouts on the night he planned to murder Maureen. In the middle of the night, the BTK killer snuck away to commit the murder, and he returned before anyone noticed he was gone. This served as the perfect alibi for him. On March 19, 2004, the BTK killer sent yet another letter to the media. He sent the letter under the name Bill Thomas Kilman, B.T.K., a clear sign that it was his letter. He also included the driver's license and pictures of a dead body belonging to his ninth victim, which he killed in 1986, Vicki Weggerly. 
Before the letter, the investigators couldn't connect Vicky's murder to the BTK killer because the crime scene was accidentally disrupted by her husband, who believed her to be alive. They used a Roos as a uh, telephone repairman to get in their house. Uh, drove there in my own personal car uh, around lunchtime, during lunch hour, or approximately that time. It was earlier in the morning than that. And uh, but my, I actually went somewhere else and changed, uh, changed my clothes, <coughs> what, I, what I call my uh, hit clothes. And, get uh, clothes. Get clothes. Uh, basically different, you know, things that I'd need to get rid of later. Not, not the same kind of clothes that I had on. I, I don't want other better word to use it. Uh, crime clothes or hit clothes. I just call them hit clothes. Uh, anyway, I walked from my car as a telephone uh, repairman. As I walked there, I donned the telephone helmet. I had a briefcase. Went to one other address just to kind of size up the house. I'd walked by it a couple times, but I wanted to check it a little bit more. Uh, as I approached it, I could hear a piano sound. And uh, went to this other door, knocked on them, and told them I was, that we were recently working on telephone repairs in the area. And uh, they went to her, went to her, and knocked on the door and asked her if I could come check her telephone lines inside. Did she allow you in? Yes, she did. What happened then? I uh, went over and uh, found out where the telephone was, uh, simulated that I was checking the uh, telephone. I had a make-believe instrument, and uh, after she was looking away, I, I drew a pistol at her and asked her if she'd go back to the bedroom with me. Is this the same 357 Magnum you used? No, this, this was a different one. A different pistol. All right, you asked her to go back to the bedroom with you after drawing a pistol on her. Yes, sir. What happened then? Uh, I told her, we went back to the bedroom, I told her I was going to have to tie her up. Uh, she was very upset, and I think we I used some material that was in, uh, and that, that's another thing, uh, I'm not sure, but I, I think I used the material that they had in their bedroom, and after I tied her hands, uh, she broke that, and we started fighting, and we fought quite a bit back and forth. All right, she was physically fighting you? Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. What happened then? I uh, finally got the hand on her and got a, uh, a nylon sock and started strangling her. So you wrapped the stocking around her neck? Yes. What happened then? Uh, I finally gained, the, gained on her and, and, and put her down, and I thought she was dead, but apparently she wasn't. But uh, after, after she was down and not moving anymore, I, I rearranged her clothes a little bit and took some quick photos, I think three of them, if I remember. And then uh, after that, I, there was a lot of commotion. Uh, she had mentioned something about her husband coming home, uh, so I got out there pretty quick. The dogs were raising a lot of cane in the back. Uh, the doors and the windows were all open to the house. There was a lot of noise when we were fighting. So I left pretty quickly after that. Put everything in the briefcase. And had her, I'd already gone through her uh, purse and got the keys to the car and used her car for my getaway car. All right, now you indicate that you thought that she was dead. Did you discover later that she was not dead? Yes, I guess the paramedics uh, arrived and they tried to attempt to re relieve her, revive her, and that, that failed. I don't know if she died there or on the way to the hospital or at the hospital. I don't recollect. After unsuccessful revival attempts, however, Vicky passed. Her two-year-old son, who was present in the house through Vicky's murder, was thankfully found unharmed. On January 1991, at the age of 45, the BTK killer would murder his 10th and final victim, Dolores Davis. You know, that particular day, I had some commitments. I left those, uh, went to one place, changed my clothes, went to another place, uh, Parked my car, finally made arrangements on my hip kit, my clothes, and then walked to that residence. Uh, after spending some time at that residence, uh, it was very cold at night. Uh, had reservations about going in. They, I had cased the place before, and I really couldn't figure out how to get in, and she was in the house, so I finally just uh, selected a, a concrete block and threw it through the plate glass window on the east and came on in. Uh, noise. I just went in. Uh, she came out of the bedroom and thought that a car had hit her house. And I told her that I was, uh, I used the, the roofs of uh, being wanted. Uh, I was on the run. I needed food, car, warmth, warm up. And, uh, and I asked her, I handcuffed her and uh, kind of talked to her, told her that I would like to get some food, get her keys, her car, and kind of rest assured, you know, walk, talk with her a little bit and calmed her down a little bit. And, uh, and then eventually I checked, uh, I think she was still handcuffed. I uh, 
went back and checked out where the car was, uh, stimulated getting some food, odds and ends in the house that I like I was leaving. Then went back and uh, removed her handcuffs and, uh, and then tied her up. And then, and then eventually strangled her. Or you say eventually strangled her? Well, after I tied her up, I went through some things in the room there and then, and then strangled her. You said you went through, were you looking for something? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a personal items, yes. I took some personal items from there and uh, tr put her in a blanket and drove her to the car, put her in the trunk of the car. So you were able to strangle her to death with these pantyhose? Yes, sir. All right, you put her in your car? In her car. In the car. Her, her car. car. Uh -huh. The trunk of her car. Uh -huh. What happened then? Uh, I really had a commitment I needed to go to, so I moved her to one spot, took her out of her car. This gets complicated. Then the stuff I had, clothes, gun, whatever, I took that to another spot in her car, dumped that off, okay, then took her car back to her house, uh, left that, let me think now, okay, in the interim, I took her car back to her house. In the interim, I realized that I had lost one of my guns. I dropped it somewhere. So I was just trying to figure out where my gun was. So I went back in the house, realized that I had dropped it when I went in the, when I broke the plate glass window. It dropped and fell on the floor right there, and I found it right there. So that solved that problem. Anyway, I went back out, uh, threw the keys, uh, checked the car real quick, quick like, uh, and threw the keys up on top of the roof of her house, walked from her car back to my car, Took my car, drove it back, and I either dropped more stuff off or I picked her up and put them in my car. And then I drove up uh, northeast of uh, Sedgwick County and dropped her off underneath the bridge. A DNA profile was created based on the bodily fluids left at the crime scenes of all of his murders. DNA technology was new at the time and this was one of the first cases where DNA was used to catch a killer in the U.S. In the end, the BTK killer's ego got the best of him. Killing wasn't enough at this point. He needed the whole world to know about his work. He was proud of it. The BTK killer's narcissistic needs ultimately was his downfall. On January 2005, the Wichita Eagle newspaper heard from the BTK killer again. One of the documents was a note from the BTK killer asking the police whether he could be tracked if he sent them a floppy disk. He instructed the police to respond in an ad in a newspaper with a yes or a no. The police responded in the newspaper ad and lied to the BTK killer that they wouldn't be able to track him down from the floppy disk alone, and they provided him an address where he could send it. About two weeks later, the police received a floppy disk. The file on the floppy disk, like most other computer documents, contained metadata that could be used to determine when it was created, where it was created, and who created it. The police tracked down the file's originating location to the nearby Christ of Lutheran Church, of which the BTK killer was president. The metadata also revealed whose account created the file, a person by the name of Dennis Radar. I need to ask you, sure, do you like? How can you like? Because I was trying to catch you. On February 25, 2005, almost 30 years after his first murder, the BTK killer was finally arrested. Families of all of his victims would finally see justice. The BTK killer's daughter recounts the moment she learned her father was the monster that had terrorized Wichita for over 30 years. I was substitute teaching in Michigan. Um, I was home that day because it was like snowy and I didn't like driving on the ice. So I was le legit still in my pajamas, <laughs> like these men green fluffy pajamas. And like uh, FBI, just one agent knocks on my door. Um, I, I didn't even want to let him in my house because my dad had always like hyper vigilant, like warned me about people trying to get in the house in uniforms or badges, which is one of the ways he got into people's houses. Yeah. So I was like legit freaked out. I didn't even want to let this guy, I made the guy like the agent show me his badge. Like I didn't want to let him in. So I finally just decided like instinct said it was okay. So I let him in and we're standing in my kitchen and he's like, do you know who? Do you, do you know a BTK? And so instantly I'm thinking like something's happened to my grandma, my dad's mom, she lived alone. Um, so I was like, is my grandma okay? Because I'm thinking like BTK's murdered somebody, has murdered my grandma. And he's like, no, your grandma's fine. And I was like, he's like, your dad's BTK. Like he just drops it on me. Sweet. And I was like, I was like, what? So then I, then I assume because you're being notified like 
your dad's a murderer. I assume like something's happened to my mom like right then. So then I'm like thinking my mom's been murdered. And he's like, no, your mom's okay. And I'm like, can I talk to her? And he's like, no, they're picking her up. And I'm like, who's picking her up? And he's like, oh, like the FBI, the police, we're, we're picking her up and we're notifying your brother. And I'm like, but no, you know, I'm, I'm literally going into shock. So I'm like standing there in my kitchen trying to grab my wall. I'm about, I'm about to pass out. So I somehow make it over to the couch, but I'm basically going into like physical, mentally, emotional shock. And I was, I, I was in shock for four days until Tuesday morning. Um, we flew me home to Kansas Monday. I was literally shaking for like four days, almost nonstop. Back at the station, the BTK killer was questioned for hours. At first, he denied all accusations, but it didn't take long for him to admit that he killed all 10 victims. Wait, you have the DNA, right? You can't get out of your DNA unless you've had a total blood transfer and lost every organ. <laughs> it's there. What you guys know? Say, say, say who you are. BTK. You're BTK. Once he started talking, he couldn't stop and confessed to everything. He spoke for over 30 hours. Dennis Radar could finally come out as the BTK killer after bottling up all of his secrets for his whole life. He was proud of his crimes and he believed them to be his greatest accomplishments. While the BTK killer was sentenced to 10 consecutive lifetimes in jail, he would not face the death penalty. This is because Kansas did not reinstate capital punishment until 1994, three years after his last killing. Today, the BTK killer is 76 years old and is in solitary confinement at the El Dorado Correctional Facility in Butler County, Kansas, where he will be in prison for the rest of his life. Murder in the first degree in count one, a class A felony. Murder in the first degree in count two, a class A felony. Murder in the first degree in count three, a class A felony. Murder in the first degree in count four, a class A felony. Murder in the first degree in count five, a class A felony. Murder in the first degree in count six, a class A felony. Murder in the first degree in count seven, a class A felony. Murder in the first degree in count eight, a class A felony. Murder in the first degree in count nine, a class A felony. And murder in the first degree in count 10, a class A felony. Do you think the BTK killer was born this way? Or do you think he conditioned himself to be a killer? Was his family just a cover? Or was he capable of having a genuine emotional connection with them? Thank you for watching and join us next time when we explore the psychological maze of some of the most wicked people.